Junior Motorsports still trying to jump up to the Cup Series by 2024. Chase Elliott can return to the NASCAR Cup Series as early as this weekend, and Kyle Busch has a new sponsor. What's going on, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to our video. We got a ton of NASCAR and other motorsports stories discussed here today on the channel. Let's go ahead and just jump straight in those really, really quickly. We're going to go ahead and start talking about Sundrop. As it was announced yesterday that Sundrop is releasing a limited edition Dale Jr. branded cans and packaging as part of its new renewed contract with the NASCAR legend. Sundrop has renewed their contract with Dale Jr. for 2023 and also 2024, and they are going to sponsor Dale Jr. on his Legends car and the car store race, I believe, at North Wilkesboro on Wednesday. Really exciting stuff for sure and really great to see a sun drop will sponsor Dale Jr. for a couple more years and I think it's pretty awesome to see that for sure that they are doing that. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Casey Kane and Mike Stefanik. As of course NASCAR is doing their new top 75 greatest drivers of all time. They're going to have the original 50 with 25 new drivers. They've already announced Tony Stewart as the first one and the next two have it announced and it's Casey Kane and Mike Stefanik. They are the second and third people inducted into the top 75 greatest drivers of all time. While there for both drivers in my ass opinion, Mike Stefanik was a legend of the Wheel and Modified Tour and Casey Kane won a lot of NASCAR Cup Series races and a couple major crown jewel events in his career. So well deserved in my opinion and congratulations to both of them on getting inducted into the top 75 greatest NASCAR drivers of all time. They absolutely deserve it. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Emmys. Now, NASCAR has been nominated for a couple Emmys. They are Bubba Wallace's race Netflix documentary based around Bubba Wallace and centered around his racing career. And NASCAR and NBC has also been nominated. One thing you're going to notice is NASCAR and Fox for the first time, I believe, since Fox basically got on the air with NASCAR back in 2001, they are not nominated for an Emmy. This is a major shock, but also not a major surprise because of the fact that Fox's coverage has not been good for the last few years. It's been shocking to have even been nominated recently, but it's not a major shock and surprise in some ways. But again, both of them have been nominated for Emmys. Bubba Wallace's documentary on Netflix, I think, was really, really awesome. And NASCAR and NBC has also done a really good job. So I'm definitely happy for both of them getting nominated, but not 100% surprised. See if Fox's coverage had not been nominated, considering their coverage has not been good in recent years. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Kenny Walsh. Now, it was reported, and Kenny Walsh actually put a tweet out last night saying that he actually wants to race in the Cars Late Model Tour. Now, Kevin Harvick has responded, and multiple people in the Cars Late Model Tour, including Landon Huffman, has also responded to Kenny Walsh. Kenny Walsh, of course, is basically doing his new uh, race day revival. It's going to be coming back for a couple more races this year, including, I believe, a gateway later this year as well. Also, someone was a commentator and also raced a lot as well. Currently still races a lot to this day. It'd be really fun to have Kenny Walsh in the Cars Late Model Tour because I think he'd be, do a really fun job in it. I think he'd do a really awesome job. And I'm excited to see that Kenny Walsh is interested because I think he'd do a really good job in the Cars Late Model Tour. Even at his older age, I think he'd do an awesome job. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Norm Benning. Now, Brock Beer, who does the last car on Brock stuff, he basically talked to Norm Benning on the phone. And Norm Benning, the rest of his 2023 NASCAR schedule is currently to be determined. Now, Norm Benning is hoping to run a few more races this year. He actually got his first lead lap finish of the season since, I think, 2020. And Norm Benning, seeing him get a lead lap finish was really awesome. Every time I see Norm Benning on the racetrack, I always get pumped up and really excited. Now, like I said, the rest of his schedule for 2023 is to be determined at this point. But I really hope that Norm Benning does come back for quite a few races this year. So I think it'd be really fun to have him back out on a racetrack. He got a top 30 finish, which is really great to see. And overall, hope we see Norm Benning out on the racetrack a lot more consistently in the future. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Hail Melon. Now, Adam Stern put out a tweet on Monday evening talking about the Hail Melon. And he says that NASCAR banned the viral Martinsville wall ride move from being made again because as you talk to Ross Chessing, he would say, that's not a move I want to make in the future. And Steve O'Don apparently said this as well, maybe over the weekend. Obviously, the Hail Melon was an incredible move for NASCAR, probably one of the greatest moves in NASCAR history, but also maybe one of the greatest moves in sport history as well. But a lot of people, including myself, think that probably should never happen again because it's not going to be this special moment. The thing is, it got banned. A lot of people probably disagreed with the Hail Melon being banned. I may disagree with it a little bit as well with it being banned. However, I understand why they banned it. It made a lot of sense at the time, 
it overall wasn't a surprise that they decided to ban it. I thought maybe in the future they were going to ban it. And I would, again, it was going to cause a lot of backlash and people were disappointed in it being basically banned. But overall, I'm not entirely shocked and surprised they've gone ahead and ban basically banned that move. And even Rosh just seems like, I don't really want to do this. So when Rosh is saying, saying, I don't really want to do this again, I think it shows that they really don't want it, that he doesn't want to do it again. And overall, not surprised that he doesn't want to do it again. So not surprised and shocked by that. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Caden Honeycutt. As it was announced on Monday that Caden Honeycutt is going to drive a 74 for CHK Racing and make his NASCAR Xfinity Series debut or attempt to make his NASCAR Xfinity Series debut this weekend at Martinsville. Kenny Honeycutt has been absolutely a star of this year with Roper Racing in the NASCAR Truck Series. I remember last week at Bristol Durham where he was contending. Now, obviously, the 74 team has to qualify their way into the show since two cars will go home this weekend. But I think Katie Honeycutt's got a really good shot to make the show. He's been really good at Marsville in his career. I remember last year, glory to God, racing how good he did. And I think he's going to surprise a lot of people this weekend. So I think he's got a really good chance to make the show. And hopefully, he'll make the show this weekend for CHK Racing at Marsville. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Jonathan Schaefer. As it was announced on Monday, uh, Jonathan Schaefer is going to drive the 30 for On Points Motorsports and make his NASCAR Truck Series debut this weekend at Marsville. Jonathan Schaefer is an up-and-coming talent player, part of, I believe, TRD's development program, and also his race in the Cars Late Model Tour as well. And I believe has won a couple of Cars Late Model Tour races in his career. Jonathan Schaefer's got a really good chance to have a decent run. He's young. I think he's got potential. We've seen On Point show some impressive stuff in the past. So I'll be Jonathan Schaefer can do a really good job, but I'm excited to see that Jonathan Schaefer is getting the opportunity to drive the 30 truck for On Point Motorsports this weekend at Marsville. Really excited about it. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Brad Perez. As it was announced on Monday that Brad Perez is going to drive the 20 for Young's Motorsports this weekend at Marsville. Brad Perez, who's been driving a lot of select starts in the NASCAR Xfinity Series for NBM Motorsports, this is going to be the first time, or the 35 for Emily Gates, I should say, this is going to be the first time that Brad Perez is racing on an oval because he generally runs on road courses. Brad Perez is one of the hardest working individuals in the NASCAR garage, and I think this is a great opportunity for Brad. I think he's going to do an excellent job. Of course, I think this truck has to make the show, but we've seen this truck have some good pace and speed with different drivers in the past, and I believe that he will have be no exception to that. I think he's going to do a really awesome job. I'm excited to see he get, he's getting the opportunity once again, and overall, I think he'll do a really good job this weekend at Martinsville. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Kyle Weatherman. As it was announced on yesterday, actually on Monday, excuse me, that he will drive the 96 for FRS Racing this weekend at Marsville. Now, FRS Racing is already tempted to make their NASCAR Xfinity Series debut as an organization. Unfortunately, they didn't get a chance to do show what they had at March Richmond due to the fact that basically rain came into play at Richmond and they were not able to qualify into the show. I think Kyle Weatherman is really underrated talent. There is weather in the forecast potentially for Friday. I don't know if they run rain tires or not in qualifying. It's one thing we'd have to watch to see if they decided to do that. But I think if he makes a show, I think he'll do very, very good. And I hope that he can do a really good job this week. Because I think he's a really incredible talent. I think he's got a lot of potential in the world. And hopefully we'll see that team make the show this weekend at Martinsville. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode. As we're talking about Anthony Alfredo. As it was announced on Monday that Anthony Alfredo is going to drive a 78 for Live Fast Motorsports this week in Marlinsville with Andy Frozen Custard as a sponsor on the car. Anthony Alfredo currently drives full-time for Beach of Cloud Motorsports in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. And I have to say, Anthony Alfredo has been pretty impressive with BJ McLeod Motorsports. And that's just BJ McLeod Motorsports equipment. Some people have said it's RCR equipment. The only thing they get is ECR engines. But they've been really impressive in the NASCAR Xfinity Series this year. Anthony Alfredo didn't have a good run at Richmond, but I think that's a lot of it due to the equipment more than anything else. I think with this being a talent-based track, I really think Anthony Alfredo could do a really good job this weekend with the team, and hopefully he'll do a really good job, but I think he's got a good chance to have a great run. But We'll have to wait and see what happens. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Derek Krause. As it was announced on Monday that Derek Krause is going to drive a 10 car for Colleg Racing this weekend at Marsville. Now, the sponsor has not been officially indicated. It might be the same sponsor that he had in Richmond in his debut. It's not really clear. But Derek Krause will be back in the Xfinity Series. 
Derek Cross did make his NASCAR Xfinity Series debut with Cog Racing, and honestly, he did a pretty good job with Cog Racing in his debut. Contended for a top 10 in his debut, and a lot of people say, well, he should run better. Well, let's be honest, Cog Racing has not been the fastest organization in the world unless your name is Chandler Smith. I think Derek Cross is a really talented driver, and I think he'll do a pretty good job this weekend at Martinsville. It's a more talent-based track than Richmond, so I think that we'll see Derek Cross have a strong run this weekend. Hopefully, he can do a good job, and we'll see what he does this weekend with the team at Martinsville. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Zane Smith. Now, we have not officially had announcements in regards to who's going to drive the 51 car for Rick Ware Racing. Obviously, on Monday, I did a special news report. Cody Ware was arrested due to assault and basically has been suspended by NASCAR indefinitely. So we've been wondering who the driver is going to be. Well, according to Joseph Strigley, while Rick Ware themselves have not announced a driver, according to him, Zane Smith is going to drive the 51 car for Rick Ware Racing this weekend at Marzel. Now, it is unclear right now if this will be the only race Zane Smith is going to run with the team or if there are going to be multiple drivers in the car. Maybe Haley Ding and Time and Jesse rotate the car if, they, if Zane is only in for one race. But I think if Zane Smith's in this car for a lot of races, that would be a really good decision for the team. Zane Smith is going to need as much Cup Series experience as possible because I do believe in 2024 he will be a full-time Cup driver. And I think this is a really good opportunity for Zane as well because while Rooker Racing isn't the fastest organization in the world, I think Zane Smith could really outperform that equipment. We saw what he did last year of RFK Racing. He did have a decent run with Frommer Motorsports, so that car really was not that fast when he was in the car. But I do believe Zane Smith has a lot of potential in the world to get a good run with Rick Ware Racing. Now, the big question, like I said, is who will be the other drivers in that car if Zane's not the only one in it? Maybe Haley Deegan, maybe Ty Majeski, maybe Matt Kraft, and maybe Ben Rhodes. Who knows at this particular point? Or maybe we'll see some other drivers get an opportunity in the car. But this is nonetheless a really good opportunity for Zane Smith. And I think he does deserve this opportunity, in my honest opinion. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Corey Heim. As it was announced yesterday morning that Corey Heim is going to drive the 24 car for Sam Hunt Racing and make his NASCAR Xfinity Series debut in two weeks from now at Dover Raceway. Corey Heim currently competes in the NASCAR Camp Craftsman Truck Series in the number 11 for Tricon Garage. And has had some decent performances and some decent runs and has contended for wins throughout the year, but has also made some mistakes throughout this year. But of course, Corey Heim, I think, deserves this opportunity. And personally, I'd rather see him in a Joe Gibbs racing car than a Sam Hunt racing car. But I think he will have the best chance and best shot that we've seen maybe outside of Tyler Reddick. I think he's got the best chance and best shot to get Sam Hunt racing a victory this year. Uh, maybe Kaz Garl does get a win as well. But I really believe that he's got the potential to really bring Sam Hunt racing a great run. I think he's going to easily contend for a top 10. And we may see him in more races if he does well enough. We'll have to wait and see. But nonetheless, a really good opportunity for Corey Hunt for this weekend. at Not this weekend, but a couple weekends down the road at Dover. This is a really good opportunity for him. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Daniel Suarez. As it was announced on Monday that Daniel Suarez will join the SRX this year in 2023 on a one-off race at Thunder Road in Vermont on July 20th. Daniel Suarez, of course, currently drives full-time for Trackhouse Racing in the number 99 car. He joins a plethora of drivers from the NASCAR Cup Series and other forms of racing in NASCAR and also IndyCar as well that will be racing in the SRX. Daniel Suarez really isn't completely a superstar, in my honest opinion, but I think Daniel Suarez definitely has a lot of talent. I think of him especially being a younger driver in this series, I really do believe that Daniel Suarez will easily be a contender to run well. I think he's got a shot at winning that race of Thunder Road especially. But talk about him joining the Asterix, you got a long list of drivers already in the Asterix this year. You've got, of course, Haley Deegan driving full-time, Brad Keselowski full-time, Tony Stewart on a full-time basis. You got Paul Tracy, Ryan Newman, Bobby Labonte. You got Joseph Newgard in a couple races this year. You got Kyle Busch for a few races. Denny Hamill's going to run one race this year. Kevin Harvick's going to run two or three races. Clint Boyer's going to run a couple races this year. The list of drivers continues to grow in this event, and I am excited, though, nonetheless, to see that Daniel Suarez is getting a shot and opportunity to race in the Asterix. He may not be the biggest superstar in the world, but having him in the Asterix, I think, is a really good decision for the series overall. And nonetheless, I am excited to see that he will be joining the Asterix at, at, at Thunder Road later this year on July 20th. I think he's going to do a pretty awesome and really good job this year. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode 
as we are talking about the Bristol Dirt TV ratings. Now, obviously, there's been a lot of intrigue around the Bristol Dirt TV ratings because a lot of people are wondering how the TV ratings go every single week. Well, according to Adam Stern, Fox earned 3.5 million viewers for Sunday's Food City 500 Dirt Race at Bristol. That is down from 4 million from last year's event. Now, that is up from the last Fox event that had 3.1 million at Richmond or the race before that at Coda, if I'm not mistaken. But that is still down half a million from 4 million. Honestly, that's not bad numbers for a Sunday night. Three and a half million for Fox is not that bad, all things considered. It's still a pretty big drop, and a lot of people are wondering why that drop is. Two or three big reasons. One, it's a holiday. Less people are probably going to watch TV, though sometimes the holiday events do happen. The Sunday nights do draw in pretty big crowds. I think it, because of it being a holiday, I think that's a big reason why we did see a pretty huge drop. Second reason, Chase Elliott effect. Now, we're going to talk about Chase Elliott here later in this episode, but Chase Elliott not being behind the wheel of the cup car has probably dropped a lot of viewership. Now, I don't think that's the full reason that that's the case, but I think that's a big factor. The other big reason, I believe, is because of the fact that we have less people watching TV. HUT numbers, I'm not sure what those are because HUT viewership generally has been up at points throughout the year this year, but I do believe the fact that less people are watching TV also contributed to that as well, and people are also probably watching legal streams or listening to the radio as well. They do count streaming, but I wouldn't be surprised if they're not fully counting streaming at the same time. So overall, not a major shock. Ratings are down. I expect it to be down, but 3.5 million is still a pretty good number for Fox, but those are the TV ratings from this past weekend at Bristol Dirt, and honestly, they're not that bad overall. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about bubble walls. Now, multiple drivers have spoken their positivity and negativity on Bristol Dirt and dirt racing in general in NASCAR. And bubble walls was no exception to this. After basically racing, I think, this weekend, or before the racing weekend happened, Bubba Wallace has asked it shouldn't ask her be racing on dirt. And Front Church picked up a really good interview. I think Steven Stump or Brandon Hopkins basically did talk about this. And Bubba Wallace basically says that NASCAR should not be racing on dirt. He says that he has a lot of fun racing on dirt and says it's basically a gimmick. And he says, for the record, I love dirt racing, and he watches dirt racing a lot. He just feels like NASCAR should not be racing on dirt. And he's not the only driver who has said something about not wanting not to race on dirt. Kyle Larson also, we talked about this on Monday, but Kyle Larson also said that he doesn't think that NASCAR should be racing on dirt. I do have to disagree with both drivers. Now, if you're against Bristol dirt, and there's a lot of talk about the future of Bristol dirt, but if you're against Bristol dirt, fine. I completely understand that. But I believe that NASCAR 100% should be racing on dirt. It gives the drivers a different way. And personally, if I had to choose, I'd add at least another dirt race to the schedule, have two dirt races, if Bristol is sick around. But if there's only if Bristol does go away, you only have one dirt race. But I think dirt racing is part of NASCAR. It's part of NASCAR's history. And why not do something that is part of NASCAR history? I think it would make a lot of sense and would be a good move for the sport if they continued racing on dirt. Again, there's a lot of drivers who love dirt racing. And I guarantee if we went to a track like Eldor, or he we went to Williams Grove Speedway, or he we went to Volunteer Speedway, which is also host of Kyle Larson's Land Model Challenge, or went to I-55 Racing, which is our permanent dirt tracks, I think you would be have a lot happier drivers who are more positive about the event. I think the fact that people really want the concrete to stay around there to have two dates, I think is a major factor. There are a lot of questions about Bristol after 2023, and we'll continue to follow the story as time goes on. But a lot of drivers have been negative about it. I don't completely agree with Bubba Wallace's comments. I respect his opinion, but I would think we should be having dirt racing in NASCAR. But that's just my personal opinion. I'm not a driver. I'm just a fan of the sport. And overall, I hope we do continue having dirt racing, though, in NASCAR in the long-term future. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Chicago Street Course. Now, generally, I like to put stuff around the Chicago Street Course in the earlier portion of the video, but we got to talk more, more, a bit more about Chicago Street Course. Obviously, NASCAR is going to be racing at Chicago Street Course in the streets of Chicago for the first time in early July. We've been following the story around Chicago Street Course very closely. Adam Stern put out a tweet yesterday talking about, it's actually Monday evening for that matter, and says, major road closures expect an impact Chicago traffic for more than a month. It was announced on Monday the road, basically about the road closures, and a lot of people in Chicago are not very happy about it. One of the higher-ups and one of the older men, I think Brian Hopkins is the name if I'm not mistaken, he's been very outspoken about the event. He says, there's no question that the inconvenience will be significantly more extensive when it comes to the traffic than we initially thought. 
Obviously, there's a lot of talk. People think that there could be a potential that they cancel the race this year. I think that it will not happen. The new mayor has coming out. I believe it's Brandon Johnson, who's a new mayor of Chicago. They're not going to cancel the event, I don't think, for this year. And if I'm the alderman of the city, I understand that they don't like the event. But if I want to be political, I keep the event for this year because it could bring a lot of money in for the city. And always being negative about this event is going to draw people away. An amount of money. And I think even if they don't like the event overall, I think they should absolutely still try to support the event no matter what. Even if they don't agree with the event, and I understand I'm not agreeing with the event, believe me, I'm not as big a fan of Chicago Street Course overall. But it also would be a bad look for the sport overall if they cancel it for this year. And again, we're not, we're, I think we're way too close to the event happening in 2000, being canceled in 2023. But after 2023, do I think they race in 2024? No, absolutely not. I think the event's going to get canceled after 2023. And I think it will either go to Road America or it's going to end up going to basically Road, actually Road America, or it's going to end up going to Chicagoland. I think Chicagoland is completely ready to go. They're going to be having racing later this year. And Road America deserves another cup date. They deserve a cup date with their attendance. And I think with the road course package especially, you take away a road course altogether. And I think the racing would be generally way, way better. So we'll have to wait and see what happens in regards to this. But it's definitely a story to fall as time goes on. And it's definitely a story to watch for as we get closer to the event overall. We're going to continue seeing a lot of bad stories. There's been a lot of negativity around the Chicago Street Course event. I think it, the aldermen should personally support the event. I understand being negative. But if you want this NASCAR to stay in the area long term, I think you have to support the event. So not surprised by the negativity. But if I were the alderman, I would go ahead and try to support the event. And now we're going to go ahead to on to the next story of today's episode as we are talking about Hendrick Motorsports. Now, Hendrick Motorsports over the last week or so after Richmond, both the 24 and 48 cars were sent to the R&D Center and were handed pretty big violations. 60 point, point, point penalties and five playoff points were taken away from both Alex Bowman and William Byer. And there have been questions evolving if Hendrick Motorsports was going to appeal the penalties. Well, it was announced on Monday for all the Cody Worth stuff happened that Hendrick Motorsports will not appeal the penalties on the 24 and the 48 cars. They basically released a statement on Monday afternoon as well, saying that they are that basically it is not related to performance, and they're basically focused on going ahead and trying to race and basically focus on the weeks upcoming and ahead. They're not completely at this moment focused right now on basically the situation here. And I'll say this, I think one of the reasons why Hendrick Motorsports is not appealing this penalty is basically to try to play politics, maybe in a sense, and not try to have NASCAR continue sending the R&D Center. Because if they continue trying to appeal these penalties going forward, I do believe that NASCAR is going to try to come down on them and are going to continue penalizing all the Hendrick cars. So I think this is one of the reasons why they decided to go away. And maybe isn't really a major factor in helping their performance out on the racetrack, but I think it is a very smart move for Hendrick Motorsports to not go ahead and try to peel every single penalty they got, especially since NASCAR, I think, is going to do whatever they can to continue penalizing Hendrick, and they're going to scrutinize Hendrick Motorsports in every shape or form if Hendrick continues to appeal the penalties going forward. So I think overall, it's a really good decision by Hendrick Motorsports. Again, I expected this. I didn't think they were going to appeal it, but this means, and William Byron was very unhappy, and I don't blame William Byron for being unhappy. Alex Bowman was like, really didn't care too much, even though he wasn't happy. Uh, you really couldn't see him being upset. William Byron was a little bit frustrated with the situation you know in a way but also i think henry motorsports in a sense has made a really good decision here to not go ahead and appeal those penalties it isn't a major shock and it's not a major surprise to me that henry motorsports is not appealing the penalties i expected them to not appeal it and overall not a shock and surprise on the front they are not appealing the penalties because if they continue to try to appeal these penalties they're going to get scrutinized and nascar is probably going to continue to be sending their cars to r&d center and eventually penalizing them overall and now we'll go ahead and jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Chase Briscoe. Now, just a few minutes ago, Chase Briscoe put out a video and basically a photo on Twitter showing an x-ray. Now, Chase Briscoe basically did respond to the situation in regard to his hand. He basically suffered an injury at Volunteer Speedway, racing in the Kyle Larson late model challenge. He did race that. He said he had a little bit of difficulty, but he said eventually it was fine racing. He plans to have surgery after the race in Marsville on Monday morning. Now, a lot of people are wondering if he'll miss any races according to reports and rumblings. He is not expected to miss any upcoming races, which is a really good thing. He'll likely wear a brace and likely wear a splint over his next six or seven weeks. It's going to probably take six or seven weeks for him to recover from this. 
it's really crazy because, again, his hand got injured in a wreck and basically had a broken hand he was racing. So it's kind of crazy that he ended up racing at Bristol Dirt and finished the whole race. And he finished fifth, by the way, which is absolutely really, really impressive. Hope he doesn't break that hand even more. He's got surgery Monday, this upcoming Monday. So we'll see what happens going forward. Hope he doesn't break that hand and has a major injury going forward. But I just saw that this morning. I wanted to share that with you guys. He will basically have surgery coming up here in the coming days. So keep an eye on that going forward. And he'll have surgery on Monday morning after the NASCAR Cup Series race at Martinsville. Not a major shock and major surprise. I thought he was going to have surgery. There have been indications he may have surgery. and saying he wasn't going to have surgery. But now we officially know that he is going to have surgery on Monday morning. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the first of three major stories in today's episode as we are talking about Kyle Busch. And we've talked about Kyle Busch a lot on this channel about getting new sponsors. Well, Kyle Busch actually has a new sponsor, and it's going to be Mark III Employees Benefits. This is now the second official new sponsor that Kyle Busch has had in the 2023 season. A lot of Kyle Busch's sponsors have been part of the Richard Childress Racing brand and have sponsored Kyle Busch throughout the year. This, I believe, will be the seventh or eighth different company that has sponsored Kyle Busch so far in the 2023 season, with Cheddar's and 3 Chai being the only repeat sponsors so far this season in 2023. Kyle Busch, of course, with, like I said, has a new sponsor. That is Mark III Employees Benefits. I don't know exactly what Mark III ben Employee Benefits does, but it's really cool to see that Kyle Busch continues to get new sponsors. And it goes back to the point with Joe Gibbs Racing trying to keep saying they couldn't find any sponsorship for Kyle Busch. We obviously know that, Kyle, that Joe Gibbs tried to keep Kyle Busch initially, but Kyle Busch also has offered a huge amount of money, and Kyle Busch denied the offer that he was initially given from Joe Gibbs. Again, Kyle Busch wanted like a $20, $25 million, which Denny Hamlin also defends Joe Gibbs, saying that it would have bankrupt Joe Gibbs. And I was a lot of people say, well, this means that Joe Gibbs really didn't want to keep Kyle Busch. Trust me, Joe Gibbs wanted to keep Kyle Busch around. But the difference between Joe Gibbs is they go after full season sponsorship. With Richard Childress Racing, they basically go after smaller sponsorships, but it's a lot more beneficial. And I think the way Richard Childress Racing is doing it compared to the way that Joe Gibbs Racing doing it, I think it's going to benefit Richard Childress Racing because you're going after less money. You're going, it's just less money that Kyle Busch definitely got. And Kyle Busch even said that it was going to be less money that he was going to be receiving with Richard Childress Racing than he was going to be with Joe Gibbs Racing. But I think overall, nonetheless, when you look at Kyle Busch, when you look at this move overall, great to see new sponsors coming into sport. This is the first time I think Mark III Bene Employee Benefits is going to be in the sport. So bringing in another sponsor, Netspen's already debuted Dakota, and we saw how much success Kyle Busch almost won with Netspen getting their first vi first victory and their first start as a sponsor. But it's really exciting to see the Kyle Busch has a new company coming in. Maybe we'll see some new companies coming in the future. Who really knows? But overall, nonetheless, it is exciting to see the Kyle Busch does have a new sponsor, and I think it's really good for the sport overall for sure. He's got new sponsors throughout the year, of course. He's had other companies that worked with Rich Schultz Racing that weren't associated with Joe Gibbs Racing, Bet MGM, Cheddars, Alsco Uniforms, uh, Three Chai, of course. A lot of other companies have come in. Lenovo has been a sponsor for Kyle Busch's at this particular point. Then Netspen's been there, and other companies could join Kyle Busch in the future. Who knows at this point? Maybe Roddy Energy sponsors Kyle Busch in the future. We'll have to wait and see what other companies do decide to sponsor Kyle Busch in the foreseeable future. But overall, it's great for the sport to see that Kyle Busch continues to get new sponsors. So I'm happy for Kyle Busch and glad to see that he continues to be looking at getting some new sponsors and glad to see he has a new sponsor for this weekend because I think it's great for the sport when new sponsorship comes into play. I'm generally really happy for Kyle Busch on this front. And now we're going ahead and jump on to the next major story in today's episode as we're talking about Chase Elliott. Now, Jeff Gordon went on Sirius and NASCAR Radio earlier today and actually gave an update on Chase Elliott. Jeff Gordon says that Chase Lake could return as early as this week at Martinsville, but also could return at Talladega or Double. Says that recovery is going well for Chase Elliott and is hopeful that he will return in the coming weeks. So it's potentially very possible that Chase Lake could return as early as this upcoming week at Martinsville. But this is really, really good news here that Chase Lake could be returning to the NASCAR Cup Series very, very soon. Now, why has Chase Selly been out since Las Vegas week? Well, obviously, one of the big reasons is because Chase Lake had a snowboarding accident up in Vail, Colorado at his family's home that his dad owns. And basically having a snowboarding accident where he got a massive injury and has been out of the car over the last few weeks. He's had Josh Berry and Jordan Taylor, who have been substituting for him over those weeks, Jordan Taylor, Coda, and Josh Berry in the other races as well. 
This is very positive news to hear that Chase Lake is continuing to recover. I would, though, be very genuinely surprised if he did return this weekend because I'll personally say this. I think Chase Lake should continue to focus on the recovery process and come back. I don't want him rushing back to the racetrack. I want him to take his time recovering. But I am very happy here that things are going well on that front because the fact that there's a lot of positive news and no negativity toward that, that makes me really excited. And again, I think Chase Elliott being back in the sport is really good for the sport. A lot of people have stopped watching NASCAR because Chase Elliott has not been behind the wheel. A lot of people are Dale Jr. fans, and when Dale, Dale Jr. got injured, a lot of people stopped watching them. And now seeing a Chase Elliott could return soon, that could help in the TV ratings department, which I think has been a big factor and why we haven't seen Chase, basically the ratings go down a lot. I think it's a big reason why the ratings have been down is generally because of that reason alone. And I think that Chase Elliott, I don't know how quick he will, because again, I think Chase Elliott will struggle at least initially because it's been six, seven weeks since he's been in a cup car. Whenever he does turn, I think he's going to struggle a little bit. And maybe what we're going to see with Chase Elliott is we're going to see Chase Elliott run part of the race and then give the car to Josh Berry, just get acclimated for a little bit, try to get at least the points, and then basically get a little more acclimated to the car and unless someone else substituted for the rest of the race. I think you have to, I don't think it's in the rule you have to run the whole entire race. If Chase gets out of the car, I think he still receives all the points there unless things have changed on that front. Unless, of course, I think, of course, if he wins the race, he doesn't get in the playoffs. But nonetheless, I'm happy to hear the Chase like is continuing to recover. It sounds like we may be getting a return from Chase Light very, very soon. I would love for him to come back this week. My prediction for when he returns, I think it's going to be Talladega. I just think we're too far in the week now for him to return at Martinsville. He's still got to get acclimated and prepared to the cup car. And like I said, I don't want him to rush back. I want him to take as much time as possible. It is a six-week period. And again, he's been doing a really good job recovering. And it would be a really quick recovery. Because remember Kyle Busch, when he got injured back in 2015, Kyle Busch is out for 11 or 12 weeks. This is basically half the process. And obviously, Chase Elliott has the best doctors. He's basically been in Colorado. He's got the best doctors out there. Hendrick Motorsports probably brought some really good doctors. And they're probably there trying to help out Chase Elliott in a major, major, in a big way. I am very happy to hear Chase Elliott is continuing to recover. And like I said, it sounds really likely that he could return really, really soon. And I think Chase Elliott is going to get a huge cheer whenever, whichever race here turns, whether it is at this upcoming week in Marsville, whether it's Talladega or whatever it is, like Dover or Kansas for that matter, you're going to hear a loud cheer when Chase Elliott gets back to the racetrack. People miss Chase Elliott being out on the racetrack. And I feel like NASCAR has really not been the same. Yes, the race has been really, really good. Without Chase Elliott being out there, the sport just does not feel the same. And if Chase gets back there, I think it's going to rejuvenate a lot back into the sport because he is the most popular driver in NASCAR. And overall, I cannot wait for him to return. Whenever he does return, I can't wait. I hope he continues the recovery process. I don't want him getting an injury and going forward. And hopefully he can return soon. I think that Chase Lane will win a race regardless. I think he will win a race and get in the playoffs this year. And I expect that he will receive a waiver here in the near future. There's been a question about that and when he will receive a waiver. I'd imagine that we're going to see Chase Lane receive a waiver as well in the coming weeks as well. Probably sometime maybe this week we're going to hear that he's received a playoff waiver. That's not been announced at this point yet, but he will likely receive a medical waiver. They've been handing out waivers like candy at this point. Also, the only situation of not handed out a waiver is with Spencer Gallagher and Grant Enfair. But other than that, every other waiver they've handed out is basically been handed out because I think Chase O is going to win a race. I think it won't be immediately. I think it's going to take him time to get acclimated, but eventually by the end of the year, he will be very competitive and out front winning races. And wouldn't it be incredible if he pulled off a Kyle Busch in 2015 and went on to win the championship, which a lot of people be calling that a Mickey Mouse championship if he did win the championship like he did when he won the 2020 championship. But Overall, nonetheless, I'm glad to hear that the recovery is going really, really well for Chase. And it sounds like Chase Lake could be returning in the foreseeable future. Cannot wait for him to return to the Cup Series. And now we're going to head into the final major story in today's episode as we are talking about Junior Motorsports and Dale Jr. Now, we've talked a lot on this channel, especially recently, about Junior Motorsports trying to get up to the NASCAR Cup Series and are trying to get a chart. Yesterday, I did a special video talking about this. Well, there's an interesting little insight that came out from the Dale Jr. down a couple weeks ago. And Dale Jr. is kind of still a little bit unsure on if Junior Motorsports going cup racing a little bit. He says he is not 100% sure if he wants to be a cup owner. With all the stress and stuff, he's not 100% sure of the stress. He says, yeah, at one point, yes, he wants to be a cup owner. But on the other side of things, he's not sure if he wants to be a cup series owner. But there's also a little tidbit in the article that Austin Ganeski wrote from Sports that based on that he is trying to acquire a charter. They're trying to get a charter, but the teams are asking for a lot of money. 
When you look at the uncertainty and the unsureness from Dale Jr., I think the unsureness is I think Dale Jr. absolutely does want to have Junior Motorsports in the NASCAR Cup Series. Where I think that uncertainty comes into play is the charter system. And there's a lot of talk about the future of charters right now, because especially with the upcoming TV deal at the moment, and charters may not be a permanent thing. The team owners, of course, they want to make the charters completely permanent in NASCAR. And NASCAR is a get, kind of think against the charter system. When you think about charter prices, from what we hear, they're at low end, they're $10 million. From what I've heard, they're like $30 million right now. And even Dale Jr. has admitted they're around $30 million for a charter currently at the mall right now. And that's a lot of money. And let's be honest, teams are probably asking a lot of money for this to happen. Now, do I think Junior Motorsports will get up to the Cup Series next year? Yes. If they are to get the Cup Series, though, how would their path go? Well, there's two teams that could lose a charter at the end of 2023. The first one being Spire Motorsports. Now, why did I mention Spire Motorsports? Well, Spire Motorsports currently has two cars in the Cup Series currently at the moment right now. And I look at Spire Motorsports in that second Spire Motorsports car. The 77 car is driven by Ty Dillon. Ty Dillon has not scored a top 20 this year. Has only had top two, top 30 finishes this year. Also, in the NASCAR Xfinity Series, guess who Spire Motorsports partnering up? Because they're going to be in the Xfinity Series of cars in Osamara this year in select races. Guess who they're getting a lot of their stuff from? Junior Motorsports. I think that that is the most likely scenario for Junior Motorsports to get up the Cup Series right now is them getting Spire Motorsports charter. But there's another wild card that's coming to play, and that's Rick Ware Racing. There's a lot of situations with the Cody Ware stuff. We talk about the Cody Ware situation really clear. What if Biohaven drops their sponsorship Rick Ware, and Rick Ware does have to sell off the 51 charter? That could be another possibility. I see this being as a less likely option, but that could be a possibility. So I think more than likely, if we're going to see Junior Motorsports in Cup on a full-time basis and with a charter, it's going to come from Spire Motorsports. Now, thinking about this team, who could they get as potential drivers to drive for their team if they do jump up the Cup next year? Well, a name that I can mention is obviously you got drivers that currently drive for Junior Motorsports. The first one being Josh Berry. Josh Berry's been making select NASCAR Cup Series starts in 2023 as a substitute for Chase Elliott. And honestly, Josh Berry has done a solid and a pretty good job this year. And I think Josh Berry would all, once again, do a great job with Junior Motorsports. Now, Dale Jr. has publicly said that he does want to put Josh Berry in that position where he has to go ahead and use him. But if I'm Dale Jr., I see Josh Berry right there. i got to give him a shot and opportunity. But also, I think a lot of teams are looking at Josh Berry right now. So he may be a good option. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, you also have Brandon Jones. Now, Brandon Jones has been a disaster in the Xfinity Series in 2023. But I think he's got time to turn it around. And he's also got that Menard sponsorship in back. I think Brandon Jones would be a great decision and a good driver to go with because I think he's a decent driver, but he's just struggled so far in 2023. Then you got Sam Mayer. Sam Mayer has not proven a lot in Xfinity up to this point yet, but I think he's a very good driver and has done a solid job in Xfinity. And then finally, you've got Justin Allgaier, who's got the most cup experience of anybody, though Josh Ray's had more race experience in the next-gen car. Justin Allgaier has a lot of cup series experience, though not a lot of experience in next-gen. But he also brings that brand sponsorship and the money, and also Kelly Earnhardt is on the board of directors at Brent. But then if you don't go with the drivers that are driving for the team currently, look at outside factors. There's a couple drivers to look at. Eric Jones is the first one. Eric Jones currently does have a contract with Legacy Motor Club right now, but you look at Legacy, they've struggled this year in 2023. And if I'm Eric Jones, I'm going somewhere else. I think that Junior Motorsports would be a great option to go if he's a driver that I would start a team off with in a big way. I think he would be very successful with Junior Motorsports if he went there. Now, I think SHR is another team that you'd be looking at for Eric Jones next year, potentially, or other organizations for that matter, or he says he's a Legacy Motor Club. But I think if you brought Eric Jones on to Legacy to Junior Motorsports, I think he'd do a really good job. And then you have other drivers. Matt DiBenedetto is another name that I mentioned. Matty D, I think, is a driver that's overhated. He did pretty good with Wood Brothers over the couple, the couple years he did run for that team and showed a lot of great pace and speed. And outside Ryan Blaney's 2017 season, he had a better average finish than other drivers. In fact, combined, he had the best average finish of anybody since Wood Brothers went back to being full-time in 2016. Yes, Matty D had a lot more cup experience, but Matt Benedetto is always underrated and does a good job. Does have a truck series win now, so you can say that. Yes, it was a controversial win, but he did a good job there. Then you have Mark Trix Jr., Mark Trix Jr. is a driver who currently is on his last year with Joe Gibbs Racing. This could be his last year full-time in Cup. What if Mark Trix Jr. jumps ship from Joe Gibbs Racing and goes to Junior Motorsports? Mark Trix Jr. <clears throat> is good friends with Dale Jr. And Dale Jr. gave Mark Trix Jr. his first opportunity and shot in the NASCAR Xfinity Series and also in the Cup Series as well. 
I really do believe the Mark Trix Jr. would do a good job with Junior Motorsports. And the final couple are obscure ones. I actually would say Kyle Weatherman is another name I mentioned. Weatherman's underrated, has done a good job in Xfinity, and I think he'd be a really good driver that Junior Motorsports should look at. Then I'll go with an obscure one. Carl Edwards. This one's probably the most obscure one, probably the most unlikely, but what if Neil Jr. finds a way to contact Carl Edwards and get him out of retirement? Every time we hear about Carl Edwards, we always hear rumors about Carl Edwards coming back and all that kind of stuff, and him wanting to come back or not race. But I think a Carl Edwards would be really fun to have him. I still think it's very unlikely that Carl Edwards comes out of retirement. But hey, you never know. And then finally, I'll mention Carson Hosebar. Carson Hosebar is going to drive, of course, in the Xfinity Series for Spire Motorsports. And I do believe that if you put him in a cup car, he'd do a pretty solid job. And, of course, he's, like I said, their partner with Junior Motorsports, Spire's Xfinity Series team is. So why not give Carson an opportunity to shot in cup? Carson, of course, does want to go cup racing in the future. Nice indicated in the past he do want to go cup racing, <clears throat> but what if Junior Motorsports decides to go with Carson Osmar and Nice decides to go with somebody else? That'd be very interesting. Nonetheless, though, I think there's a really good chance that Junior Motorsports will be a cup team in 2024, and I think there's a good chance that that could really happen next year. We'll have to follow the story closer as time goes on, but I think there's a really good chance that that could happen. So that is going to be today's NASCAR news and motorsports news video. I want to thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe, and the channel notifications so I'm notified when a video does go live on my channel. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and support me on Patreon as well. Links are going to that, and comment with your thoughts below on today's video. Do you think Junior Motorsports will jump up to the Cup Series in 2024 or not? Let me know in the co comments below. And when do you think Chase Lake is going to turn to NASCAR? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Later tomorrow, actually tomorrow on the channel, we're going to have the Nat Silly Season predictions for 2024 out on the channel. Then on Friday, we'll have a NASCAR news video on the channel discussing news over the last couple days. And then later in the evening, we'll have the Chuck Series race review pending the weather. Then Saturday, we might have a special video dropping on the channel before the race at Xfinity Series race, which will be in the evening. There will have a race review for that. And then finally, on Sunday, we are going to have the NASCAR Cup Series race review from Martinsville. And then we got a lot of news dropping over the week as well and a lot of other major projects to drop on the channel. So anyways, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's episode, and I'll see you guys next time for some more great, awesome NASCAR content and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, everybody.